So Jesus, you'll remember, is teaching in the temple courts. And uh, in, in, around the temple courts, there were offering boxes, sort of like our pedestals that are at the end where you can put tithes and offerings in. But they were shaped in sort of trumpets, or think of a big tuba, and you could put your coins and your tithes and your offerings in these receptacles. Um, and that's what you would do if you made your way to the temple uh, and you were seeking to be obedient to the Lord. You would bring some of your tithes, your offerings, and you would give to the work of the church there in Jerusalem. So chapter 21 begins, Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box. And he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. These small copper coins would have been the least valuable currency of the time that, would, that was in use. It would have been valued at about a one one hundredth denarius. That's a, a, a coin that's used often in the scriptures. And basically two of those would have accounted for ten minutes of the average labor. Ten minutes of work. This widow that Jesus sees here is the poor of the poor, um, the lowly, the one who was to be cared for and looked after by the scribes that he had just mentioned. She was in great need. And maybe some of you think, because of that, why should she give? I mean, why would Jesus commend someone like that to give? Keep what little you have. Jesus says this, though, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all she had to live on. And yet, I still think that even as we hear Jesus' commendation of this poor widow, I think my guess is that some of us are still asking this question, right? Why does she give? Why would Jesus commend her giving? Why not Jesus say, you have such great need. Keep those two coins. Um, is this just another example of one of the other reasons why people don't want to consider Christian faith? The church just keeps taking. Um, but I want to mention a few things um, that I think maybe help tie this woman's giving and just some good observations about this woman's giving and help us maybe also connect it to the idea of the previous past, uh, uh, paragraph and the idea of hypocrisy and pious pomposity, and profiteering and all that. So here's one thing. God doesn't get our leftovers. Um, God gets our first fruits. That's a theme in the Bible. We give the first to the Lord. And, and the best, he doesn't get what's left over. Um, this woman gave not what was left over after covering her necessities. She would not have had anything to give. She wouldn't have had anything to give. Don't give to God what is left over. The second thing I think um, that is really sort of lovely from this passage is that we learn that no one is too poor to give. No one is ever too poor to give. Because giving is not about amount in the Bible. It's not. It's about participation. And God actually wants you to participate in the economy of heaven. All of you have something to give. Uh, 2 Corinthians tells us that the Lord loves a cheerful giver. The book of Acts tells us that it's better to give than to receive. If we take that together, we would have to say that it would be this woman's loss to keep those coins rather than to give them. She is participating in the economy of heaven. The third thing that I think is worth not noting is that giving is an act of faith. Giving is always an act of faith. C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity says this, I do not believe one can settle how much we ought to give. 
I'm afraid the only safe rule is to give more than we can spare. Why would he say that that's the rule? Because giving has to put us in a place of faithful dependence on the Lord. Giving is always an act of faith. The fourth, the fourth thing that I want you to see is this principle. And I think this is completely true, but I, I did put almost always. The fourth idea is almost always your heart follows your dollars. Um, you know that if you want to get into running and you really want to stick to it, don't buy the cheap running shoes. You'll be like, well, I barely pay anything for those. I don't really have to use them. Your heart follows your dollars. Where your treasure is, the scriptures tell us, your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, your heart will be also. So how can Jesus say that she gave more than these rich people who were giving around her? Because Jesus doesn't count out the money. He doesn't count the coins. What he does is he weighs our hearts. And that's the only thing that matters to him. Where your heart is, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And that's the main point that Jesus is getting at. Where's the heart of the scribes? What is it that we hate about hypocrisy? Somebody says and does something that we know is completely different than what they say they believe and say where their heart is. That's what's so ugly about it. That's what we find so absolutely disgusting about hypocrisy, a life that's lived in conflict with what one says they believe. What Jesus is telling us here is that he wants your heart, all of it. He wants your heart, all of it. Jesus had no problem sitting at dinner with the very well-to-do. We just recently saw that he ate. In fact, he invited himself over to Zacchaeus' house, right? The rich tax collector. Uh, I mentioned a couple of falls ago when we were looking at the book of Philippians over and over again because it needs to be repeated. The church in Philippi was largely started by Lydia, this wealthy, wealthy woman who was a trader of purple goods. The church continued largely because she was so wealthy and sustained it. Jesus doesn't have a problem with that. But what Jesus does want is the same thing we long for. A life that is consistent. A heart that is followed by actions. Belief that doesn't stop with just mere words, but a life lived. And the Lord tells Samuel in 1 Samuel 16 that man looks on the outward appearance. But the Lord looks at the heart. I know that there's a temptation, and I guarantee we all actually feel it, because I, I know I feel it. Um, to desire to look like we kind of have it together a little bit. Um, to take things and maybe hoard them. To covet good seats. Y'all, these are actually pretty good seats up here. You can see really well. <laughs> Someday you're going to get it. Um, to have nice greetings. To have your name remembered. All that kind of stuff. But the Lord really couldn't care less how much you give. Um, the Bible tells us that he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. The Lord never needs your money. But he wants your heart. And where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And when you give your heart to him fully, it will change your life completely. Um... Let me end with this, okay? Um, I would guess that basically all of us in this room have probably heard the name, at least, C.S. Lewis. Most well-known Christian author of the 20th century, easily, and honestly, maybe the most well-known author of the 20th century. 
Um, when he died, his en- entire estate was valued at 37,000 pounds. Now, you might say, well, that was 1964, Peter, inflation. No, 36,000 pounds, his entire estate, like his house and everything. 30, sorry, 37,000 pounds. Um, you might know this, but he gave away all of the proceeds from all of his books. Um, his first really well, uh, book that sold really well was the book, The Screwtape Letters, a masterpiece that I hope you've read. Um, what he did with that is he said all of the profits of the screw tape letters are going to go to the, uh, the clergy widows fund of the Church of England, the church that he was a part of. And so it all went there, and he didn't set it up very wisely, and so he actually ended up getting into some legal trouble because of that. Because he was supposed to pay taxes on all the, pro- the proceeds of it too, and he didn't have the money to pay the taxes. So one of his good friends got him out of that, and he also set up a trust so that all the proceeds from the sale of his books could all go into this trust in such a way that taxes wouldn't be levied against him. Um, maybe you've heard this, but at one point, um, well into his career, uh, C.S. Lewis, by his own brother, had all of the house bills and all the finances from their house taken away from Lewis's control. His brother Warney lived with him basically his entire adult life. And Lewis was so generous and free with his money that they actually ended up not being able to pay the electricity bill. And Warney said, enough is enough. You need to stop giving away. But listen to this. He wrote in a letter I'm a panicky person about money myself, which is most shameful confession and a thing uh, dead against our Lord's wishes. And poverty frightens me more than anything except large spiders and the tops of cliffs. One is sometimes even tempted to say that if God wanted us to live like the lilies of the field, he might have given us an organism more like theirs. But of course he's right. And when you meet anyone who does live like the lilies... One sees that he is. So how can someone with this deep fear that's only surpassed by large spiders and tall cliffs of poverty be so free and so generous? And a life that we all have thought so lovely and books written that so many people, whether you're a Christian or not, have found so compelling and so interesting. How does this work? Well, let let me end just with this last quote. He says, Christ says, Give me all. I don't want so much of your time and so much of your money and so much of your work. I want you. I want you. That's what Jesus is saying. Give your life completely to the Lord. I want 